Hello and welcome back to another episode of Menstrual Mondays where we talk every week about a different topic on natural birth control, menstrual cycle health, fertility awareness and the strength and power of the menstrual cycle and how we can really make the most of this gift of cyclicality and really empower ourselves to shift from menstrual shame and denial into a better world to bleed in. So do subscribe and let's go. Today we're talking about the withdrawal method. Does the pull out method work? This is a question that I get all the time. Of course, when we're using a natural birth control method, so working with our menstrual cycle phases, working with our fertile phase to avoid unprotected sex when we are fertile, if we are wanting to avoid pregnancy and having sex during our infertile phase only. Obviously we have this fertile phase and often we're not talking about actually what do we do in that fertile phase. So obviously we have condoms, we have abstaining from penetrative sex, we have other ways of being intimate with our partner that don't involve penetrative sex and we have the pull-out method. When my clients tell me that they use the pull-out method, because I ask them, you know, I'm like, what are you doing in your fertile phase? Because that's also part of my job is to generally help you to avoid pregnancy if that's what you're wanting. So we're not avoiding talking about that at all. And when they tell me they use withdrawal, they're normally like, and I'm like, it's fine, you know, that is a legitimate method of birth control. Obviously it has a bad name because it's more associated with perhaps younger people. It's associated with a lot of risk because it has a lower stat in terms of efficacy and risk in terms of it's not protecting you from any STIs. So when we have our sex education in school, that's the method that is like, bad, 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 you will get pregnant and die. Um, although actually that they just generally say that about sex in general. Uh, so let's talk about actually, you know, is it, is it legit? The studies on withdrawal method are few and far between, but they have been done, but not massively because obviously who's profiting from studying the pull-out method, right? When they study condoms, it makes more sense because people are trying to sell products, they're trying to sell condoms. Uh, same goes for hormonal and medical birth control. So there's less impetus for studies to be done, but having said that, they have been done. And super interesting because they are completely not in agreement with one another. So some studies will say withdrawal method is completely ineffective because there is semen in pre-ejaculate. Some studies will say it is impossible for semen to be present in pre-ejaculate. So when we're talking about the efficacy of the withdrawal method, this is the main point that we're talking about. Is there sperm in pre-cum? So first, a little anatomy lesson. So we have the scrotum hanging beneath the penis outside of the body and within the scrotum are the testes or the testicles and this is where sperm is produced. These are the male gonads. The female gonads are the ovaries. So the testicles are the male counterpart. Within the ovaries we create estrogen, progesterone and our eggs. In the testes we produce testosterone and sperm. After the semen has been created, it is then stored for around six weeks or up to six weeks in the epididymis, which is a coiled tube located at the top and side of the testicles. An interesting fact, if you were to lay that out straight on the floor, it's about six meters long. The vas deferens is the tube which then transports sperm from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct. And when sperm is finally ejaculated, it goes from that duct 
through the urethra, which is also where the urine goes, and then out, and semen is mixed with seminal fluid. And seminal fluid comes from the prostate and the seminal vesicles. Underneath the prostate, which is behind the bladder and in front of the rectum, is the cowper's gland, which produces the semen-like fluid, which is essentially arousal fluid, which we would call pre -cup. And that, the role of that is to kind of wash out the urethra in order for the new semen to come through. Because urine is acidic, and so if the sperm is in contact with urine for too long, then it can be killed off. So the role of that pre-ejaculate is to flush out any urine that is there. So to simplify this, we can literally just say, sometimes sperm is present in arousal fluid and sometimes it is not. Possibly the reason why it is present in arousal fluid sometimes could be because when that pre-cum is flushing and neutralizing the urethra, it takes with it some semen that has been waiting there in the ejaculatory duct and in the urethra. That could be one possible reason. Another reason which I heard from a teacher once was to do with the actual um, machinery of all of this anatomy that I've been talking about. So obviously, you know, the seminal vesicles, the prostate, the epididymis, this tube, that tube, it's all like very close together and it's all just um, boundaried by small layers of tissue, right? It's not bone, it's not anything more than, than flesh and tissue. So could it be that in some men there is crossovers happening between these different storage units? Could the walls be a little bit thinner in some places and in some men where there's crossover and sperm is getting into the pre-ejaculate? Possibly. The best way to know <laughs> is really if you have been using the withdrawal method with one single partner for a while and it's been working for you. Obviously, if you're using the withdrawal method always in your infertile phase, then that's not the withdrawal method working, that's you being infertile that's working. You can also try to mitigate the chances of the leftover semen being in the urethra. So always encouraging your partner to have a pee before sex, wash his penis, and then after he ejaculates away from your body to make sure that he then pees again, washes his hands, and then that you don't have sex again for six hours. So sperm outside of cervical mucus stays alive for about six hours. So after that, then you would be good to go again if you wanted to. I don't really recommend having unprotected sex if your partner has ejaculated previously in that day, if you're avoiding pregnancy, of course. And then finally, I'd like to just note the fact that cervical mucus is magnetizing to sperm. So there is the reality of what we call a contact pregnancy, which is where penetration hasn't even occurred, but through your cervical mucus being at the opening of your vagina and then sperm or perhaps pre-cum with sperm in touches the opening of your vagina, that mucus is present, it actually like magnetizes to the sperm and can draw that up through your vagina into your cervix into your uterus and all the way to your egg so that is very much possible that is the power of cervical mucus that is it for today let me know in the comments how you found this video if you knew this about pre-cum before if you like the method if you are scared of the method and i'll see you in the next video